of Ezra chapter number four. Let's just look at the first verse. Uh, you see there the title of the message uh, is that of adversaries. And uh, let's just look what the Bible has to say in this particular text. The Bible says in Ezra 4 and verse number 1, Now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the Lord God of Israel, then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do. And we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Esarhaddon, king of Aser, which brought us up hither. So tonight we'd like to spend just a few moments looking at this idea of adversaries. Adversaries. You know, the first three chapters of this particular book are, are to me, they're, they're life-giving. Uh, they're, so, uh, they're so refreshing and so encouraging. As I as I, as I read the text and as I uh, follow what, what's happening in the lives of God's people, in chapter number one, there is the stirring of God in the heart of Cyrus uh, to send the people back and to rebuild the temple. Just a miraculous thing, and, and we've, we've touched on this quite a bit this summer, uh, but he did not just send them back without support. He encouraged the people who were not going to give financially to this effort which had to have been a huge blessing. And then he even took the sacred vessels that Nebuchadnezzar had taken out of the temple when they had raided it earlier, and uh, he, he sent those sacred vessels back that had to be worth a great sum of money. All of these things are just absolutely miraculous. The Bible tells us in chapter number two that more than 40,000 people followed the leading of the Lord. They went forward by faith. We come to Ezra chapter number three, and, and they're arriving back in the land after a four-month journey from uh, what had been the Babylonian Empire, is now the Persian Empire, back to the city of Jerusalem. And we can only imagine the condition that the city was in after 70 years of relative um, just abandonment. Oh, there were definitely people living in the region, but probably not very many people living in Jerusalem. And so certainly there was a great deal of work that had to be done, but the people were all in. And, and then I find, we just talked about this the last time we were together, something so encouraging. One of the very first things that they did was they found where the original altar had been. And they repaired that altar and they began once again to sacrifice unto the Lord. God is pleased with all of these things. And then, of course, there is the dividing up of the Levites and the priests, and there is the sort of transitioning to them, the responsibilities of rebuilding the temple as they have their roles. We talked about all of this over the last uh, several weeks in which we've been in this particular book. And, and up through Ezra chapter number three, all the way to the end of the third chapter, it is just one good and positive, and we might even say miraculous thing after another. And there is, uh, you know, there is just steps of faith that are being taken by people, and there is God that is at work in all of these, in all of these circumstances. And, and I just have to tell you, it'd be wonderful, it'd be wonderful if all of these things could continue in this same form and in the same fashion, wouldn't it? Wouldn't that be just great if every day they woke up and there was more the, uh, of the temple that was being built and there were more people that were uh, getting right with God and, and repenting? As we understand, the return back to Jerusalem was much more than just a geographic or a physical return, but it was a spiritual revival work that God intended to be, uh, be transforming in the lives of his people. And yet, you know as well as I do, don't you, that if you've lived any length of time, you already know what is coming. You already know what's coming. Uh, if you don't know the book of Ezra, you're sitting here and you're reading it and you're thinking, wow, this is fantastic. This is encouraging. This is refreshing. This is life-giving. But hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. We know, we know that there is an encounter. There is a battle coming at some point down the line because that's just the way life is, it's just the way it's lived. And in Ezra chapter number four, we're introduced to the adversaries of the work of God, and we see their clear attempts to stop the work from any further advancement. And I just have to tell you, this should not come as a surprise to us. Who among us is reading this and going, wow, I didn't see that coming. I had no idea that the devil was gonna get in the middle of this thing and try to, uh, try to thwart the efforts of, uh, of, of the uh, Holy Spirit of God and the people of God as they try to resurrect uh, the temple and, and bring back worship of the true God in the place where God intended to be. I never saw it coming. Nobody says that. 
We read that and we think, up, oh, there's the plot twist. We saw it coming a million miles away. It's like watching a Hallmark movie. You know, you, you can know it. Oh, that's the guy right there. That's the one. And they're going to get married somehow. He's working at the coffee shop. He's serving the, you know, he's serving the pastries. He's the one, no question about it. And when we read the book of Ezra and we come to chapter four and verse one, we say, oh, there it is. Saw it coming a million miles away. We knew, we knew there was going to be an adversary. There had to be an enemy in there somewhere because that's just the way life works. Someone once said there are two certainties in life, death and taxes, right? I think that's the phrase. But I, I suppose we could add a third, and that would be adversaries or opposition, or we might even say difficulty. In fact, Paul, the Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth these words. He said in 1 Corinthians 16 and verse number 9, he said, for a great door and effectual is opened unto me. And that's the encouraging, refreshing, life-giving phrase, right? But he didn't stop there. If, if you're looking at it, you're seeing that there is a comma there. And then he finishes that thought with this, with this statement, and there are many adversaries. Now, we believe, we believe in a Bible that is inspired every single word. In, in other words, we believe that our Bible, uh, there's no errors in it, there's no mistakes in it, um, there, there's, nothing, there's nothing that is missing that God would, would want us to know, and, and there's nothing that is here that is sort of like, well, I didn't intend to tell you that, but it's in there, or that's just some creation. Man, no, we believe in a verbally inspired Bible, and we believe in the idea that every word in our Bible is inspired by God. And, and that word, and, is so critical in that text, 1 Corinthians 16, 9, he says, a great door and effectual is open unto me. And then he says, and there are many adversaries. Now, now, had he used the word but, had he used the word but, that would denote that this is sort of the exception, but he didn't use that word. Instead, he used and there are many adversaries. In other words, like this is no surprise that there's a great door and there's effectual that is open unto me and we all saw it coming. We knew that because this door is so great and it is so effectual and the opportunities are so great, we already knew that there were going to be obstacles and there were going to be opposition, there were going to be problems. This is not a but, this is an and. It is the, it is the rule, it is not the exception. That's what he's saying there. So understand this, there will always be, newer word that we use sometimes today, haters. There will always be haters. There will always be naysayers. There will always be enemies, and there will always be opposition. And can I say, listen, this is true. This is true about life in the simplest tasks, but it is especially true. It is especially true if you are trying to do the work of God. What is, um, is, it, Murph, is it Murphy's Law? Whatever, whatever can go wrong will go wrong. Uh, that is, that's true in my house. It's true in my house, when I'm going to work on something, I don't have the right tool. And even, let's just be frank, even if I did have the right tool, I wouldn't know how to use it. And, and even if I do have the right tool, the thing still won't cooperate with me, and I, I strip the thing, or, you know, who knows, who knows, and it's just an absolute disaster. And my wife, already, she can hear the sigh. There's a sigh of exasperation that I give. And she knows, I, I've been working on it for five minutes, and I'm already done. I'm already done. Why? Because whatever can go wrong will go wrong. You know, you men that, you know, you run up to Home Depot and you get what you need and you bring it home and you get home and you realize, oh, got the wrong size. Or this is not the right one. This is not going to work for whatever reason or another. And if that, listen, if that's true about home improvement projects and it's true about fixing something with your vehicle and it's true about what you're doing at work, you can understand, you can understand that that's just sort of, that's just sort of the law of life. That's living life here on this sin-cursed earth. And if that's true about those things, you better believe it's going to be true about trying to advance the work of God and do what God's called us to do. That there will be opposition, things will not go the way that we would have anticipated, the way that we would have hoped, the way that we would have liked. Successful businesses, successful people, and even successful sports teams, they, they study very closely their competition, don't they? 
I mean, they observe and they try to learn what they can. Uh, they look to gain an upper hand by, by figuring out strengths and weaknesses and, and looking at tendencies. What do they do in this scenario and how do they handle this crisis and what do they do uh, with, with, with this influx of, of success? And, and so they look at uh, tendencies and they look at uh, strategies and, and, and they, uh, they, they, they try to work through all, of, they look at weaknesses and, and all of these things. And can I just say, can I just say that if, if, if as we as God people want to be successful, I think it would make, us, make some sense for us to study our adversary as well. It'd do us well to look at the adversary and to sort of try to figure out how he works and what he's trying to accomplish and what he is trying to do. Now, the Bible does have much to say about our adversary or our enemy. And by studying God's word closely, we can see what the, listen, what the enemy has done for thousands of years. You know, a, a sports team, they'll look at all of the game tape from the, from the last year or, or, or what this coach has coached, and, and they try to study tendencies. What does he do in this scenario, and what does he do in this situation, and how does he handle this? And can I just tell you that you and I have the Bible, we have the Word of God, and it tells us how the enemy operates. It tells us how the adversary works. And, here, and here's why. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 2.11, lest Satan should get an advantage of us. For we are not ignorant of his devices. In other words, in other words, God says, I've given you this book, lest, lest Satan should get an advantage of you. I don't want you to be ignorant of his devices. I want you to know how your adversary thinks, and I want you to see how he works, and I want you to consider his strategies and, and, and look at his strengths and look at his weaknesses and consider his tendencies and, and, and how he tries to get into people's lives and try to destroy them. I believe we can learn a great deal about adversaries and those who oppose people of faith in our text tonight. While this while it may apply, certainly in some ways, to a, to a matter you may be dealing with, maybe in the workforce, or in your neighborhood, or in your home. Some of you are sitting here and you're thinking, adversaries, you're thinking, oh yeah, yeah, the guy that is in the, in the office next to me. Or the guy that's on the machine next to me at work. Or, you know, the, uh, the guy that lives two doors down, he's an adversary of mine. You know, if, or, or, or I, God forbid, but you might even be thinking, thinking of your own spouse. We say the word adversary. You might even think, well, that's my wife sometimes is like an adversary. My husband sometimes is like an adversary to me. And so some of these principles, listen, that we'll look at, they may apply in some of those instances, but I want you to understand the context in which we're dealing with here. This, this message is specifically speaking of adversaries to the people of God who are doing the work of God by faith. So again, we're, we're talking about a context here. So this is not, this is not about how to deal with all of, your, all of your adversaries in life, you know, the, your, your political foe or your neighbor down the street or, uh, you know, the person on social media that you're trying to compete with. It's not, it's not about that at all. This is specifically speaking about the, the people of God doing the work of God by faith or in obedience to the Lord and how the adversary comes against them and what can be learned uh, in that adversarial relationship. So again, it may not be fair to apply these truths to every situation that you're dealing with, but especially not the situations that involve the people of God doing the work of God by faith. If it's, if it's not along those lines, this may not necessarily be about that, but if we're thinking specifically about the Christian life and about doing the work of the Christian life and living by faith, then I believe that these principles and these things that we discover in our text apply. So let me share just three of them with you here tonight. We, we don't have time to go much further than that, and we'll pick this up the next time that we're together. But notice number one, we discover that the adversary may not be able to keep you from getting started, but will work to see that you are stopped. When we think about the adversary, the adversary may be powerless to keep you from getting started living a life of faith and growing in your faith. They, they may not be able to keep you from going down that road, but here's what you can, you can rest assured, that that adversary will not rest. He will spend the rest of your life coming at you, trying to, to get you to stop growing in your faith and trying to get you to stop doing what you know that God has called you to do. We see that in verse number one. The Bible says, now when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple, well, what's happened here? It's already, the work has already started. 
And the adversary comes along a little bit later and, and doesn't, maybe doesn't even realize all that's happening. And all of a sudden, they start to get word. Wait a minute, they did what? They, repa- they, they rediscovered where the original altar was and they, they rebuilt it? What's that, what's that smell? Oh, that's the smell of burning flesh. I wonder what that's all. Oh, that's not, a, that's not a barbecue, that's sacrifices. They're sacrificing to God again. And then they, and then they hear the sound of, of, of great, end of chapter number three, the sound of great weeping and great rejoicing at the same time. And they say, what is the sound of that? And, and, and somebody comes along and says, well, that's the sound of the young people rejoicing that the foundation of the temple, the new temple has been laid. And it's the sound of the old people who are crying because they remember the first temple. And, and they're sort of filled with sorrow that this temple's not gonna be able to compare to the first temple. But the, but the point remains, what is that sound? The sound is people, uh, people react acting and responding to the temple as it's starting to be rebuilt. The work of God has started. There's, there's nothing that can be done about that now. We cannot go and undo what has already been done, but here's what we can do, and here's what we will do. We will work tirelessly to see that we stop the work of God from going forward and from advancing. That's what the adversary does. Now think about all that had happened. The people of God, they woke up to the news that Cyrus was wanting to send them back to Jerusalem so they could inhabit it once again. And not only that, but he was sending them back to rebuild the temple. I mean, they're, just like, a, just like a, a, a moment in time, their 70-year captivity is over. And their long-awaited return back home is finally becoming a reality. And all of this is being done because of God stirring in the heart of King Cyrus. And more than 40,000 returned back home at the king's urging And upon arriving back in Jerusalem, they rebuilt the altar and laid the foundation of the new temple. And the people rejoiced over God's stirring and they rejoiced over the response of the faithful. And they rejoiced that the work of God was advancing. And the enemy, listen, the enemy could do nothing. It was powerless to keep this work from getting started. Why? Because God had prophesied that this was going to happen hundreds of years prior. God had already said, in fact, God had already named the king long before he was ever born that was going to be the one that would, 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 further this and get, and get all of this going. He called him by name Cyrus in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 44. So, so God predetermined it to be. He decreed that it was to be. And the enemy, listen, was powerless to stop what God, listen, because what does the Bible say? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. And God had spoken very clearly in his word that at, at the end of the captivity, a man by the name of Cyrus, at the end of 70 years, he's gonna send the people back and here's why they're gonna go back. They're gonna begin to rebuild the temple and, and, and God says, listen, it's been decreed. There's nothing that's going to stop it. There's nothing that's gonna keep it from moving forward or moving ahead. So the enemy could not keep this work from getting started, but here's what it could do. It could do all it could and was able to do to stop the work from achieving completed status. Can I say the adversary may not be able to keep God's work from being started in the lives of God's people. The work of God, listen, it is advancing in the hearts and lives of so many people. I mean, how can the devil possibly keep the Holy Spirit of God from stirring in the lives of men? He's powerless against that. That's what the Holy Spirit does. And the Holy Spirit will always be more powerful than the devil. The devil cannot resist what the Holy Spirit is trying to do. And how about the word of God? It is, the Bible says about itself, it is a living book that has been promised to never be destroyed. Paul, Paul himself, he said, he wrote about his, himself, he says, I suffer trouble as an evildoer, even unto bonds, but the word of God is not bound. You know what Paul's saying? Paul's saying, you can, you can handcuff me and you can throw me in jail and you can take my head off and you can silence me for the rest of time and the rest of eternity. But he says, you can't do that to the Bible. You can't do that to God's word because it cannot be bound. Isn't that encouraging? I'm looking around and I'm seeing things that are troubling in our culture and our world and I'm thinking to myself, there may, be, there may come a day in which we're not allowed to, we're not allowed to preach as boldly as, 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 we, as we are today, that we don't have those freedoms and, uh, and, and by God's grace, we're gonna keep preaching even if they tell us we can't. But even if, even if they come in and they haul us away and they, uh, they silence us and they uh, refuse to allow us to stand in an open place and they bind me as the pastor or uh, as a preacher or as a, as a minister of the gospel, listen, they can never bind this book. can't be done. It's impossible because it's a living book. 
And he's saying, you can bind me, you can shut me up, but you can never bind God's word and you can never shut God's word up. When a man reads God's word and the Holy Spirit moves, listen, there is no power on earth that can stop this force from going forward. And millions of men and women have believed on Christ and, and because of that, they'll spend eternity in heaven. And there's nothing the devil can do about that. Aren't you, aren't you glad to know that? If you're here tonight, aren't you glad to know that there is nothing the devil can do to steal away your salvation? It is settled. It is secure. You are a child of God. You've experienced the new birth by faith. It, it, it is a, a glorious thing. Somebody was asking me recently, well, do you believe in the idea of once saved, always saved? And I do believe that. Not because it makes me feel better, but because it's a Bible truth. It is a Bible concept, you know, that they, the Bible says that he gives unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Can't be done. You cannot, you cannot take a, someone who has received God's gift of eternal life and, 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 and cause them to perish. That is an absolute impossibility. They followed up that question, sincere person. But they said, well, there are people that say that, you know, if that's the case, then, you know, then you can just go on living any which way you want to. And I understand that, but Paul already addressed that in the Word of God, didn't he? He asked the question, he says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? And then he gives the answer. It's two words, God forbid. No way. Not if you've truly been born again. Uh, you, you, you're, you're, a, you're a married man or a married woman tonight. You know, do you, do you continue to make your wife miserable just so you can watch her forgive you over and over and over again? No, God forbid, you don't live that way. Not if you truly love her. Not if you truly uh, are passionate about what God has given you in that marriage relationship. And the same thing is true spiritually. If you've been born into the family of God, the last thing you want to do is disappoint your heavenly father. It doesn't mean that's not going to happen. It doesn't mean that that's not going to be something you deal with from time to time. But here's what it does mean. It troubles you. It bothers you. So, so the devil can do nothing about taking away our salvation, but here's what he does instead. He sets his sights on stopping any further work of faith in the life of, of us as individuals and as believers. I mean, it'd be nice if the adversary would simply leave, leave, us, leave us be, right? If he'd just leave us alone. But we know from God's word that's just simply not the case. Now the Bible tells us in 1 Peter 5, 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. And here's the question. Why do you suppose he works so hard to stop the work of God from going forward in the lives of believers? Ever thought to ask yourself that question? I'm sure there's a myriad of answers. But I, I, I just as I was thinking about this thought earlier today. Why is the devil working so hard? Two primary reasons, and, and I'm sure there can be many more that are listed, but let me share them with you. Number one is this. Believers are the primary vehicle through which the gospel advances. So in other words, why is he working so hard to resist you and to, and, and to stop the work that God is doing in your life? Because he, know, he knows this truth, that you are the primary vehicle through which the gospel goes forward. That's what we are as believers. You say, well, what, what do you mean by that? How do you know that? Well, did you know that before Christ left this, left this earth, he, he gave what we call the Great Commission. He gave it in several different places. And, and did you know that every time he gave it, he gave it to his disciples? He gave it to men. We, we, believe, we believe that, that actually these men were, just, were, were much more than just a, a group of people that kind of you know, uh, followed him around. We believe that, that this group of disciples was already a church. We believe that Christ established the church when he was here on this earth. And they all had the same baptism and they all believed in the same Lord and they gathered and they worshiped regularly and they were actively working to bring other people into this assembly. And by the time we come to the day of Pentecost, there's 120 that are already meeting regularly, small group, but it's there. And, and so Jesus, Jesus looked at what we would say is the first church. And he said, go ye into all the world. And preach the gospel to every creature. All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and preach the gospel. And taking the word of God to Jerusalem and to Judea and to Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. I mean, you read Matthew 28 verses 18 to 20 and you read Mark 16, 15. And you read Acts 1, 8 and a myriad of other places. And you will find that Christ tasked his followers, believers. He, he, he tasked his church with advancing the gospel. It is our, listen, it is our responsibility 
for the work of God to be advanced to the ends of the earth. Now listen, I can't save anybody, but I do have an obligation and I have an opportunity to use my voice to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ everywhere I go. And so the devil, the devil, why does he he try to thwart God's work from growing and advancing in your life? Because he knows, he knows that if he can say, he can't can't keep you from going to heaven, that, that work is already settled and secure, but he knows this, he knows this, that if he can slow you down or if he can stop you all together, listen, the, 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 the work of God ceases at least in your life. No one, no one from you is going to hear the gospel. No one from you is going to be saved. No one from you is going to be discipled and growing in their faith. So why do you suppose he's working so diligently to stop the forward advancement of the gospel in our lives? Well, number one, because we're the primary vehicle through which the gospel advances. But number two, here's why. Because believers are the bride of Christ. Believers are the bride of Christ. A familiar phrase says, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Now chew on that for just a minute, because some of you maybe, you've, you've never heard that before. But think about it. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. So in other words, if I, hate, if I hate somebody, and I don't think I do, but if I hate somebody, and I find out that guy over there, that, that guy hates that same somebody, hey, we're buddies. We're, we're friends because we hate the same person. In other words, we are united not because we have similar passions or similar, similar loves or interests. No, we're, we're, we're united because we hate the same person. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. If, if that's true, and I believe that, that there's a sense in which it is, then, then could we not say that the friend of my enemy is my enemy? So if I hate someone, and I find out that the person that I hate is really buddy-buddy with this person, and, and, and they have a close relationship, well, then all of a sudden now I start to kind of look at them skeptically, because I'm sitting here going, well, why don't you hate the same person I hate? Can't you see what a miserable person he is? Can't you see how mean and nasty and rude he is? And the reality is I'm, I'm probably the only one that's mean and nasty and rude in the entire equation. But that's how we think. So the enemy of my enemy is my friend. The friend of my enemy is my enemy. You're getting real confused, aren't you? I'm getting confused up here too, so bear with me. Now here's the question. What can we then say about the spouse or the lover of our enemy? Now think about that. Now Christ is the enemy of Satan. Satan. Satan every moment. Every moment that he has been present on planet Earth, every thought, every thought is to destroy Christ. To destroy Christ, to destroy Christ, to destroy his work. And 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 here's 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 what here's what he's he's come he's he has to have come to the conclusion he cannot destroy Christ. He's tried over and over and over again. But here's what he can give his time and his attention to. How about if I I can hurt Christ by destroying his bride? By hurting his bride. If we're Christ's bride, then automatically, listen, automatically we have become Satan's enemy. Satan hurts Christ or tries to hurt Christ by hurting his bride. He will do everything in his power to resist the bride. The Bible says in Ephesians 5, verses 25 to 27, he says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So that's, listen, what, what you see right there, what you saw just a minute ago, what you see right there is what Christ wants to do for the church, his bride. That's the kind of bride he wants. You better believe this. You better believe this, that what Christ wants, Satan is actively opposing. He is resisting. So the point is this, because, because you and I are saved and we're part of the church, then, then, then we're included in this. This is what Christ wants. He, wants. he wants a bride that is sanctified. He wants a bride that is clean. He wants a bride that has been washed by the water of the word. He wants a bride that is glorious. He wants a bride that does not have spot or wrinkle or any such thing. He wants a bride that is holy and without blemish. And you better believe, you better believe that Satan, with all of his might and with all of his power, is doing everything he can to keep the bride from being sanctified, to keep the bride from being cleaned. I've tried over and over and over again, and I've lost at every turn, but here's what I can do. Here's, I find the weakest link, and the weak link is the bride. The groom cannot be defeated. The groom is too strong. He's too powerful. Maybe I can get at the groom by hurting his bride, and that's us. That's why, that's why the adversary is working so diligently in your life and in my life and in the life of our church and doing everything he can 
to make sure that the bride is kept from being sanctified, cleansed, and washed, glorious, without spot, wrinkle, or blemish. Let me say number two. We must hurry, but we see number two, the adversary. Just learning some things about the adversary. The adversary will appear friendly for an opportunity to oppose the work of God going forward. Now look with me if you would in verse number two. Then they came to Zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them, Let us build with you, for we seek your God as ye do. And we do sacrifice unto him since the days of Ezra Haddon, king of Aser, which brought us up hither. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel said unto them, Ye have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus the king of Persia hath commanded us. So again, we're looking at tendencies. We're looking at strategies. We're looking at strengths and weaknesses of the adversary. Notice that the first attempt to slow down or to stop altogether the advancing work of faith was to use a very interesting weapon, and that rep- weapon is friendliness. Now, you should know this. You should know this because, because likely if you're anything like me, some of the Some of the most evil people in the world are some of the nicest and kindest people you've ever met until until you cross them, until they realize that you're you're not wavering in what you believe and in your stand on things, until they cannot manipulate you and they cannot destroy your faith and what you believe. Uh, I've had people tell me, you know, you know, this group of people, boy, they're the kindest people you've ever met. Well, that's right in line with what we find here. Because the first attempt that is made to, to stifle the work of God by the adversaries is to, is to do so using friendliness. Here's what the adversary thought. They thought that if they could get the Jews to allow them to join up with them on the work site of the temple, then they would have a golden opportunity to destroy things from within. You know, if, if, the, if they let the enemies, the adversaries on the job site Maybe just maybe one day somebody walks home and they take with them the plans and the blueprint and they just kind of toss them in the fire. Or perhaps maybe over time, uh, objects and materials that are necessary for the building, you know, some of the cedars that came from Lebanon and maybe some of the gold and some of the precious uh, metals and some of the uh, precious vessels that have been, sacred vessels, maybe those things begin to disappear slowly but surely. Maybe the tools begin to walk off the job site. Why? Because we've allowed, listen, we've allowed the adversary access to the work of God and to what God's trying to do. We don't necessarily know all that they had planned had they been successful, had the Jewish people been you know, gullible enough to say, you know what, yeah, you're right, you guys live around us and you tell us that you worship like we do, so come on, the more the merrier. We need all the help we can get. We don't exactly know what all they would have done, but certainly we can surmise that they would have worked diligently to destroy the temple and this building project had they been given the opportunity. God's people wisely refused to allow heathens and pagans to be given the opportunity to be involved in the work of the Lord without, without first sincere repentance and evident life change. I'll let that sink in for just a minute. Here, here's what I think is, is, is being hinted at here, or maybe even being boldly stated. That is this, words are never alone sufficient. Words are never alone to be sufficient. Here, here's, here's what I mean. The Bible says in Matthew 7 and verse number 20, by their fruits ye shall know them. Not by their words. Any, listen, anybody can say anything, and many people do. And they talk a good game and they talk about how much they love the Lord and how much they love God's word and, and, and how spiritual they are and how many, you know, how many spiritual encounters they've had and how they were raised and how they were baptized. And they've got all of these, I've done this and I've done that and I've jumped through all these religious hoops and I'm a really, really good person. But listen, words, words alone are never sufficient because that's exactly what these people are saying. They're saying, hey, let us, let us come help you. We worship the same God. In fact, we, we sacrifice to him just like you do. In fact, we've done it this long. We've done it, we've done it so long as we've been here. But listen, words, words are not enough. The adversaries said all the right things, but here's the, here's the point. Their lives did not bear the fruits meet for repentance 
that are required by God in Matthew 3 and verse number 8. Verse number eight. Here the adversaries were eager to say they worshiped and even sacrificed to the true God. But the leaders among God's people, they knew better. Zerubbabel and Jeshua firmly resisted the adversary. Their answer, listen, I love their answer, it leaves no wiggle room whatsoever in anyone's mind as to whether or not the adversary would be welcome to be involved in the work of God advancing. Because here's what, here's what they said. They said, you have no part, you have nothing to do with us. You have nothing to do with us in this job. Those are the exact words that they use. That's boldness. Now that, is, that is boldness. In fact, today, today that's considered offensive. That's hurtful. I mean, come on. But not, these, guys, these guys, they weren't playing around. They understood, they understood what the enemy was trying to accomplish. And they knew that if they allowed the enemy anywhere near the job site, that it was going to slow down the work of God from advancing. Proverbs 1 and verse number 10 says, My son, if sinners entice thee, consent thou not. I would say that this is an example of sinners enticing. Because who, who, couldn't, who couldn't use 150, 200, maybe, maybe 1,000 or more, more laborers? I mean, don't you think that this job that was in front of them was a daunting one? Rebuilding the temple? I mean, with, with, you know, with, with limited funds and with limited resources and limited tools and abilities. I mean, you guys are captives. That's what they've been all their lives. And, and for, for a group of people to come and say, hey, we want to help. We want to be involved. Uh, we want to we be laborers together alongside of you. Oh, that would have been, been a glorious thing in most people's minds. Can I say that we are living, we are living in a strange world. What I mean by that is that the world that we're living in is a world in which the church is openly seeking the world's influence in order to reach the world itself. That's what's happening. In other words, listen, we're living in a day and age in which the adversary is not coming to us. We're going to the adversary. The adversary isn't knocking on our door saying, let us in. We've thrown the doors open and we've said, hey, listen, you know, if you'll partner together with us and if you'll fill up our buildings and you'll fill up our offering baskets and, and you'll, you know, you'll come, you're, you're more than welcome here. No, 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 don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Any, any person who is lost, we pray they come. We pray they come. But not so, not so that they can influence us, but so that we can influence them. So that we can preach the gospel to them so that we can warn them of a hell that is hot and that is eternal and that never fades away. That, that's why we pray that they come, so we can see their lives change, so we can see them set free from a bondage and from addictions and from uh, all sorts of wickedness. But we don't throw the doors open and tell them, hey, you come in and you tell us what you want and you tell us how you think we ought to operate things and, and you come alongside and you serve us and you do this and you do that. No, not, not, that's not the way it's to be. Listen, we want them to come. We want them to hear the gospel so that they can learn and grow from it. But they cannot, listen, they cannot be permitted to lead the way or influence the way that we worship and that we serve. And to allow the adversary an opportunity to be involved in this work is to allow him, listen, to allow him to simply destroy the project from within. It's the, it's the classic Trojan horse, horse situation in which the gift is made, but inside, listen, inside are sinister people who are waiting for an opportunity to destroy them. They're already in, within the walls of the city. They've already, they've, they've already entered the gates. There's nothing that can be done. And may God help us to understand that sometimes the adversary uses friendliness as an opportunity to oppose the work of God going forward. Number, number three tonight, we'll finish here. The adversary will use discouragement to oppose the work of God going forward. Look at verse number four. Then the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building, and hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. So when their attempts to be included on the job site were resisted, and Jeshua and, and uh, the other gentleman there, his name is escaping me, something, Zerubbabel, that's it. When they said, no, you, you, you're not allowed here. You have no part with us. You have nothing to do with us. When that didn't work, I said, well, let's go to option two. Let's get, a little, let's get a little mean and a little nasty. And let's use discouragement. And this is the new strategy. And they intended to weaken the team of laborers who were building the temple by troubling and frustrating them. Now listen, the Bible doesn't tell us all that was done, but most Bible scholars agree on the following. 
Three things that, that they did. Number one is that discouragement we see is especially devastating when there is a lack of commitment. Discouragement is especially devastating when there's a lack of commitment. Now, you know as well as I do that, that the adversaries likely targeted those who were involved in the work but not all that committed to it. So in other words, these guys, these guys, they didn't go after Jeshua. They didn't go after Zerubbabel and some of the other men that were leading the work. Their names were listed here. They probably didn't go after the Levites and the priests. They probably found the guy that was, you know, installing a window over here. Or maybe pouring some concrete and mixing things up. Not a guy that was in a leadership position. And he's, do, he's doing the job. He's doing the job and he's, you know, he's happy to do it. But at the end of the day, you know, I, I, it'll be neat to see the temple built, but you know, it's not the end of the world if it doesn't all work out. And there's people like that in every church, aren't there? You know, well, you know, I, I love my church, but you know, if it, if it went away tomorrow, it wouldn't be the end of the world. I'd have more free time on Sundays and, and on Wednesday nights, and I could probably improve my golf game, or we could get that boat that we've been wanting. And I mean, you, you understand what I'm saying. For some people, church is their life. And for other people, it's, you know, hit or miss. If I feel like going, if I want to be there, if it all works out. Can I say, can I say that for, 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 for those people, discouragement is an especially devastating tool? Because already they're lacking commitment. It doesn't take a whole lot to get them sort of, you know, out of the picture, so to speak. And you better believe, you better believe that these people that troubled and weakened the hands, they didn't go after the leaders. That's sort of the head of the project. They went after the hands of the project. They went after the people that were doing the work, but they were, you know, they were just sort of going along to get along. Like, well, we're here. This is why we've been sent back. And we'll be allowed to live in our home and in our land if we rebuild the temple. So we might as well rebuild the temple. Uh, that, that this was sort of the, more than likely the attitude, and without them, listen, without them being involved, the work would be troubled, and the hands of those who were committed to the work would be weakened. And so understand that dis- the devil and the adversary, they know that discouragement is especially devastating to those who are lacking in commitment. But notice, notice there's a second thing that we understand about discouragement, and that is this negative words discourage people. Negative words discourage people. I have to think that the adversary would have attacked the less committed laborers with words of negativity. Can you, can you imagine some of the phrases that they would have used? Here's the guy, he's over here, he's pouring a little concrete, you know, he's laying some stones, he's putting some bricks in, it's hot, he's tired, they're just getting started, I mean, the first row of bricks has been laid, and I mean, this thing's going to be high, and it's going to be vast and massive, and here comes, here comes the adversary, and sort of with a sneer on his face. He says, you'll, you'll never finish this. I mean, come on. Look, look, at, look at what you've done. Look at how many people are involved in this, and look at how much more you still have to do. When I was a boy, uh, my grandpa, my mom's dad, hired me one summer. He's going to pay me $100 to repaint his house. Now, he got a good deal, let me tell you. He saw me coming a mile away, didn't he? He says, I'll, I'll pay $100 to repaint my house. I was a teenager. And I was all about it. $100 to me was like $10,000. And I remember he, his house was green. I remember I got out there one day and, and, and he gave me the paintbrush and the paint and he gave me a ladder and he said, have fun. And he walked away. And I, man, I'm eager. I'm ready to go. I start, you know, splashing paint up on there. And I'd never paint anything in my life. He must have been crazy. Truly, I, I didn't know what I was doing. I start painting. And I'm, it's all good for about the first 15, 20 minutes. And then my hand starts to get tired, you know. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, this is, this is no good. You know, it's hot. And, 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 then I, and then here's what I started doing. I started looking, and I'm looking at the whole side of the house, and I'm thinking to myself, that's just one side. And I mean, I, I mean I'm not even, I, I've been at this thing now for an hour or two, three hours, and I have not even hardly made a dent in it. And I got discouraged. And the adversary came to me, and he said, you'll never finish this thing. No, it, was a, it was not an audible adversary, but it was an adversary nonetheless. You'll never finish this thing. Don't you, don't you think that there were some adversaries walking up to the people of God who are doing the work of God, but really aren't maybe all that committed? And when they start saying things like, you'll never finish this. Or maybe, may, maybe here's, here's a line that they use for discouragement. This temple will never compare to the original one. So why even bother? What's the point? 
That's just pathetic compared to what was once here. I mean, really, come on. What's the point? Why even bother? And you hear that, listen, you hear that enough times, and you're already sort of lacking somewhat of commitment. And you start to hear that message over and over and over again, and you start to believe it. Discouragement. Negative words discourage people. Maybe, maybe there are even outright threats aimed at these workers. You keep, you keep this up, and we're going to make sure. We're going to make sure you lose your house. You lose your job. You're going to get arrested someday because we're going to report you to the authorities. We're, we're working all this out. It's coming. It's coming down the pike. You, you just better watch your back. Did you know that, notice thirdly, that they even enlisted lobbyists to slow the advancing work. Did you see that in verse number five? The Bible says they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose. Most Bible scholars believe these lobbyists would have lobbied in the king's court, slandered maybe the advancing work. We're going to see that they did that the next time that we're together with a letter that they wrote. I mean, they used, many of them are believed to have gone to the men who were providing them with the cedars from Lebanon, the men of Tyre and Sidon, and, uh, and, and would have you know, slowed them down, maybe gotten them involved in other projects. Hey, we got a, we got a great project for you here. Why don't you, why don't you now quit sending, sending so much wood down to Jerusalem, and why don't you start diverting the wood over here, because we got a great project over here. And the, and the Bible says that they, they literally hired counselors. In other, words, in other words, they were so passionate to defeat this work, they were willing to invest financially in making sure that the work of God could not go forward. What do, what do we learn tonight? Listen, there, there, there's a great work that God wants us to be involved in, but know this, know this, there are always going to be adversaries in this great work. Don't be surprised when they come. And here's what you need to do. Here's what I need to do. All of us need to do. We need to study the tendencies of the adversary, and we need to know how he operates how he thinks, uh, some of the tendencies and some of the tools and the weapons that he uses. We need to be on guard against these things.